Hello and welcome to Conversations with Nareet. My guest today is John Sherman. I actually heard about John Sherman, actually my husband told me about you, uh, mm -hmm. about uh, three years ago or so. He found you on YouTube and um, he loved this. We both love the simplicity of your teaching, of your work. And um, we also loved your history. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> My husband is somewhat of a rebel. So when he heard that you, about your background, uh, he liked it very much. So um, uh, what we, as I said, we, lo we love the, sp the simplicity of your teaching. Um, we uh, try to, to convey that message as well to, to people. And um, we, we also find that um, your work is so, uh, what you teach is so doable and so practical and to the point. And uh, there's no mysticism about it. There's no future you know, promises or anything like that. So can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, what the, we have discovered over a period of, oh, 17 years now, I began my so-called career as a spiritual teacher and uh, had a lot of difficulty in um, making sense of the tropes and and uh, ways of speaking that spiritual teachers must use. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I have to say that although I was um, well, although nothing, I have to say that the the whole business of the idea that. Uh, um, I think what I, I could not have articulated this at that time, but I think that what troubled me was the idea that what is needed in order to be rid of the misery of being a human being mm -hmm. is to stop being a human being and depart from the whole uh, endeavor of, of humanity mm -hmm. uh, into uh, you know clear uh, clear mind and nothing going on and, and so forth and so on. Paradise, basically. And, I, and given my background, that really wasn't um, something that uh, seemed right to me. There was something, despite my own experiences of, of a spiritual accomplishment, uh, it didn't seem right to me. Mm -hmm. So that for the first six years of our time in this uh, strange realm, uh, we traveled around and, and basically offered satsang to people, as is the, the uh, popular uh, spirituality that is present here in this country and pretty much throughout the, the uh, at least the you know, the Euro Europe and uh, places like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a lot of trouble. I had a lot of trouble and I was considerably um, you know, not very good at what I was doing. <laughs> uh, although people liked me. I'm a likable sort, I think. <laughs> So in that six years of traveling around, we traveled around all over the country and everywhere we could go. And uh, in that six years, what came of that was finally a recognition that whatever we were doing, it wasn't what we ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. So that after six years, and I've, I've mentioned this from time to time because I kind of like the sound of it, we uh, came back from a trip and and had a satsang, which I later referred to as Escape from the Spiritual Ghetto. Yes. <laughs> because that was kind of my sense of it, that, that spirituality has become a ghetto, which, uh, which you, know, you, can, you don't escape from. Mm 
if you do escape from it, you're probably better off than continuing the, that, 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 that course of action. Right. So for the next six years, we pretty much didn't go anywhere. We had some meetings, you know, like they tapered off over time. We had some meetings, but for the most part, we stopped having meetings with people. And that was due to my uh, sense that what I was trying to tell them wasn't what I really wanted to tell them. Wow. That, that the tropes and ways of speaking that is uh, spirituality in these days just was couldn't carry what I wanted to say to them, what I wanted to say about what actually was the case in my own life. Yes. And those ways of speaking couldn't communicate that. Mm -hmm. So, and still I, you know, the, the, the grip of spirituality is very strong and very deep. And, and a lot of it is uh, not even noticeable, right? The, those things that keep you with that in that mindset. Yes. So it took some time. It took actually until the last couple of years really to uh, be free of that approach and free of that context actually mm -hmm. um we started we started meeting with people online again you know about uh, maybe six years ago or something like that and and used our uh, used the opportunity of being able to speak to people to come to an understanding of what it was that really had happened to us mm -hmm. and what and how to speak about it without resorting to uh, terminology that really is too highfalutin to carry the simple message that we have to say. Yeah. <clears throat> In the last couple of years, we have pretty much consolidated our, and I say, I'm saying our, because it's Cardo and I that are working together. I think I'll probably say me from now on just because it's a little easier for people to understand and, and I'm to, to, who's responsible for this. Mm -hmm. So in the last couple of years, I have actually, and partly in good part, what has been extremely useful to me is the fact that we put up a forum in our website mm -hmm. and the people who had been doing what we were suggesting that they do began to come to the forum and talk among themselves and in observing that and and seeing what it was that was behind what what they were talking about that uh clarified and made very plain that my my intuition as to what how to go forward was actually mm -hmm. true we right. could see the the results of what we were asking people to do, and they were consistent and consistent over their own, the, the people who were doing it, and they were consistent with our own, my own, own understanding of what was happening and what we would, what could be expected in, in, as time goes on. So my, my, uh, my clarity has, has, uh, has, blossomed in the last couple of years mm -hmm. and my willingness to depart from any particular frame of reference in speaking about this has become confirmed and uh, so so here's what I think and let me get to what I think is the case for us humans who yeah. are struggling here in lives that don't make any sense and and uh, you know, just the way the humans, the human nature is. Mm -hmm. What I, what I am convinced of, this is what I'm speaking of now, is what I am convinced of. This is what I know. Pretty much all human beings, pretty much without exception, although I'm certain there are exceptions and I have some sense of uh, some uh, instances of that. Mm -hmm. But pretty much without exception, when you're speaking about 7 billion people, we are 
early on in life. And I, my, it's my opinion that it most likely happens at the birth trauma, the, that, it, that it is caused by birth, or the trauma of birth, which is, I'm certain you know, is a horrendous experience for the, the fetus as it uh, is expelled from paradise, really. Yes. And uh, what, what happens due, because of that is that the context in which the person's mind will form becomes infected with what I call the fear of life. Uh -huh. That there's nothing wrong here. The, the context of the mind is, has the sense that there's something wrong, there's something to be afraid of, things aren't as they should be, right. and you have to find some understanding that'll, that'll get you through this terrible experience of being alive as a human being. Yes. And it is this context, it is within this context that the mind up, uh, up appears. And the mind itself is a conglomeration of uh, psychological algorithms, really. Psychological th algorithms that, you know, if this, then that. Right. And, and they are all infected with this disease. We think it's more useful to see it as a disease than as some failing in the human being or the, the work of God or the work of the devil or the work of any other supernatural force. Right. And it is our, it is precisely the contamination of our mind with this fear of life, with this sense that everything here is wrong. Right. Uh, you know, that, has get has brought us to the idea that the solution to this must come from outside ourselves. It yes. must come from some some uh, spirituality or some metaphysical source that we have to tap into in order to to uh, get over this business of being. The best we can do is die and go to heaven, really. Yes. And uh, uh, so that it's very understandable that that's the case. And it's very understandable that uh, in particular religion and spirituality are the go-to places for people trying to get make sense of their lives without putting themselves in the hands of the psychiatrists and psychologists and, and uh, drug dealers and so forth. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's not surprising at all. So... And it's not that the sense that there is some other realm that is the problem. You know, there is a sense that there's more to this than meets the eye, more right. to existence than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. But that's not the problem. And there's no solution to be found in that other than to kind of go to sleep, really, in the name of being awake. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so what we have come to see, and this is something that actually works, is that what we call just one look is referring to the possibility of using your attention to get a direct taste, a sensation, it's not a metaphysical thing, a direct taste of what it actually feels like to be you prior to the mind, prior to your experiences and so forth and so on. That, that to have attention actually touch that simple experience, mm -hmm. and it's a sensation, it's very faint, it's, but it's there for everybody. Mm -hmm. Very faint, it has no particular characteristics to it except that it's kind of sweet, you know, it's kind of soft, and but very yeah. faint, it's very hard to to uh, capture, to get an actual direct taste of. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing is that if you try, if you actually will try to understand what it is I'm asking you to look at and try to do it, that you may not ever have the sense that you succeeded, but you actually can't fail because <laughs> it's you, you know? <laughs> That's right. Right? <laughs> Yeah. And, and, uh, and this is proven to, you know, this is proven, to, we have now thousands of people 
who wow. have have done this and and all the reports are similar and the same and consistent with our understanding of what's happening. Fantastic. <clears throat> yeah, and it's only recently that our understanding of what's happening has solidified enough, has, has, has become clear enough for me to speak about it in the way I'm speaking about it now. Mm -hmm. I hope to speak about it as we go forward. Mm -hmm. So that there's not an element here of them listening to me and then their mind, you know, picking that up and because most of these people uh, ha have been with us for years, although many of them we've never heard from. And through those years, when I was struggling to find a way to speak about what I see, uh, the stuff that I was saying then couldn't possibly have turned into the results that they report. Mm. Okay? Because the real results are not what you would expect in something that's going to Put, do away with your misery about being alive as a human being. Mm -hmm. So what happens is this. The person does the looking, which is very simple, and we, we will, for the, for the usefulness of your audience, go through this a little bit later. Okay. Yep. First, they, first they do this act of looking. Normally, what often happens, the, the, the most common report and which is consistent with my own experience and also with Carla's experience is that it's extremely difficult to accomplish this, but that no matter whether you think you accomplished it or not, within a couple of days or weeks, there's a, a, a peacefulness that comes to you, mm -hmm. a sense of, uh, of uh, satisfaction, you know, and not things aren't bad anymore. It's okay. kind of like a honeymoon. And this can last for weeks, maybe months, but without exception, so far as we have known, of all the people we have spoken with, without exception, after that period when everything is sweet and so forth, everything goes to hell. <laughs> yeah. Everything goes upside down. <laughs> Healing and yeah. It gets worse than it has ever been. Yeah. This is, uh, and this is very confirming, really, when you consider it. Mm -hmm. What we what we see that happens in that period. Oh, and our Carla, our we we call this period that and ensues after the the sweetness, the recovery. Recovery. Yes. This, this is a disease. It's not yeah. a shortcoming. It's not ignorance. It's a disease from which you have to recover. And the symptoms of that disease are contained in all of the, the mental uh, phenomena that, are, that, that can constitute our minds. Yes. And all of those gazillions of little algorithms that, that make up our mind now are bereft and lost and no longer have the the foundation that used to carry them through mm -hmm. so they go even crazier than they used to be yes that's our sense of what happens in the period of recovery mm -hmm. and they're trying desperately to save you from this terrible thing that you have done <laughs> yes really and and uh, that's my feeling of it in my own recovery which took a long time and was not very nice at all. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, having seen that, and having you know come to a to a, a, a kind of a sort of a comprehensive understanding of what's happening to the mind in the course of this thing, mm -hmm. we also have, and this happened, we. I don't exactly remember when this occurred to us as something to offer to people as help for this period. But what we have discovered is, and this is this is really quite uh, fantastic, quite wonderful. Starting for, with the insight that you really don't have any control over anything other than what you attend to. 
There's nothing else that you directly control. As mm -hmm. I'm speaking these words, there's these words are happening before I have anything to say about them at all. Mm -hmm. They just happen. Uh, uh, and that's the way that we are. Our attention is drawn by bright, shiny objects and ugly, horrible objects. And for most of us, until it's not the case, for most of us, the, our idea of having a control over our attention is absent. Yes. Attention just does what it does. But it turns out, and this is obvious once you see it, that attention is the only thing we actually have anything to say about. We can determine for ourselves in the moment what we attend to. Yes. So when we are in the disease, we don't know how to do that because we're the, we're kind of captured by this sense that there's these things that are taking care of us and we have to pay close attention to what they say and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. But what happens is what we've discovered, and this is really a discovery, is that you can learn and you can become extreme, you can become strong and, and intelligent in controlling your own attention. Yes. And so that we started offering people and suggesting to people that they start a practice of what we call self-directed attention. Mm -hmm. And what that consists in is to, and this has similarities to other um, things, but the, the similarities are superficial. What we suggest to them is that they should get control over their own attention. And that, as I said, attention is the only thing we can do anything with. And attention is, feeds whatever it touches. Yes. The energy that the psychological algorithms use comes entirely from the energy of your attention on them. So what we suggest to people to do is this simple exercise mm -hmm. in which they start by watching the breath. We tell them that to get comfortable, sit comfortably, and uh, start noticing the feeling of the breath as it comes into and out of the body. Mm -hmm. We suggest that it's the out breath and the breath of the, nos the nostrils that they use because that's a clear and, and simple uh, you know, feeling, a sensation that can be counted. And we urge them to, to start counting with the first out breath and to count to 10. For each out breath, you count one and you get to 10. And then when you get to 10, you're, you're good. Well, as it turns out, and I can say this from my own experience when I first started with this, getting to one, getting past one is almost impossible. Really? Which, is, uh, which is, reveals how little control we have ever had over the only thing that we have any control over. And what happens usually with almost everybody is that they say one, and then they're taken off on a train of thought. Yes. and uh, which goes on for some period of time. And after that some period of time, it comes to them, oh, wait a minute, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be counting my breath. And we tell them to return to one. It takes some time before they get through to one, past one. But in that time, there, everybody, anybody who does this, and I was, Carl and I were the first <laughs> experimenters in this, so I'm speaking from my own experience, after a time it becomes quite easy and natural for me to decide for myself what deserves my attention and what doesn't deserve my attention. And I don't bother to pay attention to the things that don't deserve my attention. I just look at something else that does. What this produces in me is a sense of self-reliance that is 
not possible to understand until you get it for yourself. Yes. You know, it's just, it's, it's, and what occurs after recovery is finished and doing this exercise uh, accelerates through the recovery. And what happens after that is you find yourself a human being in a human life and uh, capable of, of doing good work and capable of understanding what's happening, some of what happens to you and not as other things. And you find that just ordinary human life with a self-reliant mind that is not sickened with the fear is fantastic. It is just satisfying in a way that can't be imagined until you see it. The problems, the small problems that come up in life become, you know, um, are welcome. They're, 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 they teach you things about, not about spirituality, but about human life, about being a human being in a human life. And that's pretty much what we do. We get them to look, and we are now in the process of of uh, actually changing the focus of our work from the looking, which always is easy, right? And what, what of course, that came, our focus on that came from our own indoctrination into spiritual uh, ideas about what's good, what's, what works and what doesn't work. <clears throat> so once, once you look, you don't have to worry about that anymore. So what we're trying to shift our focus to, because we see how people suffer in yeah. during recovery, and we see them in the forums and how horrendous it becomes, they all get better in the end, but still, you know, it shouldn't be that hard, right? <laughs> so we're trying to shift our focus mm -hmm. from the act of looking, which must happen, but is easy, can't fail to encouraging people more and to take control over their attention and thereby take control over their relationship with their life. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. That's the long and short of what we're doing here and our ideas about it. And we, we, uh, there's nobody here but Carla and I, and we, uh, we are now trying to find a way to uh, get the resources necessary to make this thing m grow in the world. Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, it's our only hope. Yes. We're, we're done. And yeah. this, is the, this is the only real hope, the only real possibility if we can drive human the human creature sane, we might get through this thing. Yes. Right? Yes. So. It's, it's, uh, insanity is rampant in our world, unfortunately. It is. Yeah, it has been for a long time. Yes. Well, if nothing's really changed, you know. No, except it gets, the, the, the force of it gets bigger. Yes. It, it's like a cyclical uh, recurrence that on a higher level, every hundred years or so and we're we are uh, in desperate straits now yeah. and we really need to go sane yeah. well it's like you said it, it's it's a sickness and uh the sickness if it's not treated it, it gets worse yeah and it's, it just snowballs into something horrific and we see that you just have to turn on the news that's all you have to do you see that yeah, yeah. But when so, you're trapped, when you're trapped in that, that uh, fear, because yeah. that's what the, the whole thing is fear. Yes. When yes. you're trapped in that fear, you can't even imagine that there's anything other than what's happening in your mind now. And there's anything other than enemies or, or uh, allies in the world. You yeah. know, it's just not possible. It's not like you can reform your, your way of looking at things. You reform your way of looking at things into something equally crazy and insane yes yeah I, I like how you describe 
you know, the, the problem starting at birth, I often feel like um, that is extremely traumatic being born, uh, exiting the womb and where we feel probably in the womb mo most connected to our source and then being and then being separated from that and being in a body. And I often wonder if um, if that is the reason part of the disease, the, the, the one of the symptoms of this disease is the need to overcome the separation and therefore we have all these spiritual searches yes and, right and and in so many searches spiritual teachings they try to do away with the body you know you're not the body you go transcend the body do astral mm -hmm. traveling anything just to get out of the body and uh so i like the simplicity of just feeling the nostrils and i read your um I downloaded uh, what you wrote. Um, uh, no, no more fear, no more anxiety. Where you talk about feeling the tongue, even and it just the, the going into the inside the body is is uh, I feel so important and so close to our our true nature. And I feel part of the disease is that we lost that. I think yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean we. We, we, we see the body as an impediment as far as we are concerned. And, yeah. we, and it's either to be uh, made better or made worse or, you know, like done away with or, yeah. you know, the, the leading cause of death for people under 30 is suicide throughout the world. Really? And, uh, and that's what, we, that is at the heart of pretty much everything we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, and the thing is that we actually have something that fixes it. Yes, you know, it's not we don't have something that transcends it. We have something that fixes it. Yes, and that's uh, and I do believe I'm absolutely convinced that those, and especially the ancient ones who first struggled trying to find a way out of the misery of being human beings, mm -hmm. that they actually accomplished what we are teaching. And by, just by sheer force of will and, and uh, determination and the circumstances of the way their mind works and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, but when, when that was happening, and I, the, I include the Buddha, who, whomever he might have been, and, uh, and, and a few others, right? Actually, I include Jesus in it, too. I think he also accidentally touched himself and, and uh, you know, the whole business about being born again just rings in my mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but that that was so long ago that was those pioneers were were so long ago they were in a time when we thought the earth was flat for crying yes, out yes. so the only thing that was available to them to their understanding as to what happened to them was uh, uh metaphysical matters you know spirit or whatever religion and most of it turns into religion mm -hmm. but i believe and the other one i think it, that this is true of is Ramana. I think Ramana, and it's almost obvious with him, it's so, yes. the, the history of his, his, uh, death, his death experience and the time he went, spent in the tier of Anomaly trying mm -hmm. to understand it and was brought all the books about religion and so forth. It's mm -hmm. just obvious with Ramana. Right. But they, are, they have been, they were all, crippled by what they could understand about it and uh and now now we have this situation in 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 the realm that that uh that the buddha and, and ramana and, all, and some others i can't name them all but i know them um i don't even remember what i was going to say <laughs> but uh, we, well, what we can do is we can see we have a lot more 
experience over time as to the nature of being a human being and th the nature of our minds and so forth, although we don't know much about them until we get rid of the fear, mm -hmm. that, that we've, we have settled on psychological matters and some psychiatric matters. And, uh, and that has done nobody any good so far as I can see, either, either one of those approaches. They, they at best can provide a, uh, you know, a, a circumstance where people can get by, right? Where they can, can and that's, that's okay. You know, we have a, uh, there's a group of, uh, a small group of psychologists and, and uh, who put together a, a paper called The Radical Act, which was submitted to journals and it has been picked up by one psychological journal and uh, in which they talk about the psychological implications mm. of what we're doing here. So. <laughs> That's great. So yeah. tell me about your own process. How did you arrive at all of this? How did you get started? Uh, I, I like the way your your biography starts by saying, in the years that I was unconsciously searching, <laughs> 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 I can relate to that. <laughs> well, you know, I was, uh, I was uh, raised by my grandmother, mm -hmm. who was a Pentecostal Christian. Mm -hmm. And I learned to read at the age of four uh, from the King James Bible. Oh. So that was the beginning of my uh, 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 relationship with these matters. And uh, the, the, for most of my life, and it didn't mean much to me, right? But it went home in a way that the first things that you understand about things go home. But it didn't mean much to me, and I really kind of thought that it was stupid and and especially, you know, some of the more energetic uh, instances of uh, Christian uh, practice. Uh, and I spent, well, I, I was in the army. I, you know, I went to the army. I was in Germany for a while. I served an apprenticeship as a machinist. I, I worked for some years in, uh, in a shipyard uh, doing machining work. I, uh, and, uh, you know, I was a journeyman machinist. I'm good at that, or I used to be. And then, but through it all, I was, uh, I don't know how to exactly characterize it. I was useless. <laughs> I was, uh, I, I was doing no no one any good anywhere. I was cheating people every chance I got. I became I turned into <clears throat> a kind of con man. I spent some years uh, doing uh, credit card fraud when the credit cards were brand new and. Uh, and uh, I eventually got caught by, <laughs> I had purchased a car. I was married at the time to, to a woman, and obviously. And uh, uh, when we almost were caught, I purchased a car with a non-sufficient funds check. And in those days, you could actually do stuff like that. It was a used car. It was a Chevy, a nice used Chevy and went to Oregon to get away from the, you know, the consequences that, that were about to befall me. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I went to Oregon and, uh, and, you know, I wasn't in a position where I could embark on new criminal enterprises because it was a new area and everything. So I went to work and, uh, <clears throat> I think I was, I forget exactly what I was doing. One of the things I was doing was selling Alberto Culver hairspray to supermarkets. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, that, and, oh, I, and I've got a job in a photocopy company. And, uh, you know, 
uh, like a, you know, one of these, uh, it was just a, it was a photocopy place. And the day came, the, the time came, I'm not going to use up a lot of time on this, we're talking about many years, but the, the time came when I went to work one day and uh, the police were there to arrest me on a warrant from California for interstate transportation of a stolen motor vehicle, which is a federal offense. And it was bogus, but I got convicted and was sentenced to three years in McNeil Penitentiary in Washington State. In, in, in the penitentiary, I, for the first time, learned about Marxism and Leninism. And it completely took me. It was so the insights into the nature of the way, what I would now say is the nature of the way that the disease has, has developed over time, the insights into the, 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 the terrible thing of being, uh, of capitalism, uh, took, took me. I actually, a friend of mine and I had a 13-day work stoppage in the penitentiary with no violence and no... So anyway, we, we were doing things. I got out of prison, and uh, <clears throat> one thing led to another, and I ended up with a friend of mine from prison, and we started doing property bombings and so forth in the name of of uh, Marxism-Leninism and to punish the ruling class for their for the trouble that they had caused the entire world. That went on for some time. We, I was uh, caught in a bank robbery. We were caught in a bank robbery. I was shot. Uh, one of us was killed, and uh, I was shot in the head actually, and and. Uh, was in was you know, my jaw was wired closed for a long time while I was in jail, and then after oh, I don't know six weeks or so, when I thought the wires were coming off, I, uh, one of the people who had not been caught at the bank uh, came and and took me from the sheriff that had, was uh, transporting me to and from the hospital. And that guy got shot, but he's fine. He, you know, he's not. He got shot in the process. So I was in big trouble. <laughs> I, and I, you know, with this small group of us, we continued for a couple of years doing uh, bank robberies and other things of that nature, all in the name of uh, proletarian. Uh, liberation. I was finally caught uh, again in, and uh, sent into the sentence that was to sent to the sentence that was to uh, keep me in prison for the next 18 years. Although I escaped again. Yeah. Uh, and, Good for you. <laughs> from Lombard and was uh, put on the FBI's 10 most wanted list and I was on the 10 most wanted list for a couple of years and then I was caught again and I went into prison for the rest of my time. After many years in prison, uh, uh, I happened upon a spiritual teacher that was coming into the prison and I, I failed to go because I for reasons that are crazy and I just didn't want to go. I was, I had some resistance to the whole thing. But then, at, then I started meeting with uh, Buddhists who were coming into the prison and uh, from Naropa, Trungpa Rinpoche's, uh, oh, yeah. you know, I was in Colorado at that time and uh, uh, the people from Naropa were coming in. And when they, and they, they had this thing, they don't teach by trying to speak to you about things. They read the teachings from the book, right? Mm -hmm. 
And as the guys were reading these teachings from the book, my experience was that I know all of that. Wow. That's very familiar to me. And it made absolute sense to me. And it was like, it was really amazing how, how much it took me. Before I was done, and I did get involved with a spiritual teacher in the more esoteric realms. And, uh, but before I was done, they brought a, a visiting uh, Lama from uh, uh, Tibet to give me uh, refuge and bodhisattva vows. I sometimes now think that uh, the bodhisattva vow was a mistake. <laughs> 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 but not really. <laughs> And uh, so anyway, I did that, and I had a period of uh, in just complete clarity. This was but from this spiritual teacher person. And I had a period of such clarity and unconcern, and everything was just wonderful. And I, I saw a dead baby bird, and it spoke to me in a way that, revealed things to me it was really quite crazy and uh and then that all collapsed it's you, you might almost think that it was a recovery but there was never anything to recover from mm. and uh and during that period of time i read a lot i read everything i could get my hands on about the whole business having to do with atma vichara and and the whole thing mm -hmm. When I collapsed, when it collapsed, which it did, and left me in terrible trouble, I, they, I was, um, I was thrown in the hole for something that I didn't do. And uh, so I was in the hole, and I, and everything had collapsed, and I came to the idea that what I really had to do was rid myself, because I still was really interested in Ramana. Ramana had a big effect on me. Mm -hmm. And I decided that what I had to do was to destroy all of my ideas about what he had said by actually accomplishing what he said we should do. <laughs> and that would reveal to me that it was all garbage because if, if I knew that I had done it then I'd know that it was garbage well it didn't turn out quite that way I uh, <laughs> I tried to do it in the manner that he suggested you know with the heart and the, and all of that and and then one day when I was in the shower I a, a memory came to me from childhood in which I was coming out of a movie theater. I had seen this movie, I was maybe eight or nine. I had seen this movie, uh, Winchester 73, which by the way is a really quite good movie. It still holds up. And I came out of the matinee into the hot summer sun of a New Jersey summer, which is not great. <laughs> <laughs> and and as I was remembering all that, as that all that came into my memory, mm -hmm. I got this insight that told me that what I felt like then was exactly what I feel like now. Wow. And that's when I accomplished the act of looking. Wow. Because it actually had a direct taste of me. Okay. The sim simplicity of me. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that at the time, but one thing led to the other. I went through some trouble. I, most of it, most of the time after that, I was in the, kind of the honeymoon stage. I was due to be released, and uh, I uh, didn't believe they were going to release me because they sh never showed any sense. Only the judges were good to me, but the <laughs> rest of the people weren't. And uh, I sat, and this is the first time I realized something really, really phenomenal had happened. I, they take you to a holding cell, 
and the person who was responsible for uh, effecting my release actually came in early in the day and my jacket, my file was like huge. And he went through every piece of paper in it, trying to find some reason why I should not be released. Yeah. And the thing that was remarkable about it was that I didn't care. I mean, it wasn't like I didn't, I didn't care. I just didn't care. I was okay with whatever happened. And I just sat in the holding cell and waited and, and eventually they let me go and one thing led to the other and uh, I, I was released in uh, Boulder, Colorado and went to a halfway house and then I spent some time with the spiritual teacher and uh, in, everybody moved to California and uh, uh, one thing led to the other and Carla and I happened and and uh, we began to understand what had happened to both of us. And, uh, and here we are. Long story. <laughs> I sh shortened it as much as I yeah. could. Yeah, I was going to ask you, but I think you've already answered the, um, how the act having to teach this has changed your experience of it well it, it's taught me having to teach it taught me that what i was trying to teach in the beginning like i said in the beginning i was carl and i both were driving all over the country doing satsang mm -hmm. and not really that you know we were doing okay as far as our our income and you know and and a lot of people liked us and we were doing okay in those regards but it just wasn't quite right and what, i what was it what was different about it did you, you i didn't it? believe in what i was telling them oh and and i began to make that plain that i'm not saying what i really want to say mm. and and i and tried to enlist their help in uh, in teaching me what it was that I really wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And I told them that that's what I was doing. I started telling them that that's what I was doing. I'm really not, that's not really what I want to say, but I'm, you know, trying. Yeah. And it was in that period, that six years, and then six years more, without doing many meetings, that, uh, that the, 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 actuality, the simplicity of what I was trying to say uh, dawned on me. And of course, you have to understand that during all that time too, because I and Carla both were in recovery ourselves. So things were very confusing and very, very uh, difficult to, to, we knew, to our credit, we knew that what was happening to us. We didn't know how, why it was happening, but we knew that we were not really clear on what it is that had happened to us and that we had to get smarter about it. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, so, uh, and the, I have to, I'm gonna tell you one more little anecdote. And that is the time that I realized for the first time that something un, believable had occurred to me mm. and it was when we were li we were living we live in Ojai, california now and we were living there then it was a couple of years ago several years ago i don't remember exactly when. <clears throat> but i used to smoke camel cigarettes i smoked uh you know non-filtered camel cigarettes for all my life i didn't smoke a lot you know maybe half a pack a day but I smoked camel cigarettes and I had a habit when we were here of going out just before getting cleaned up and going to bed and having a smoke on the back porch. And uh, I was out there on the back porch smoking my camel cigarette and the thought came in my mind without bidding, uh, you ought to quit this, this is going to kill you. And then another thought, 
followed it up and said, well, yeah, but it's too late now. You know, if, you're, if it's going to kill you, it's already going to kill you. And then a third thought came that said, well, it might be too late, but it can't be too early. <laughs> and that was the first sane thought that I can remember ever having had. And I threw that cigarette away and never smoked another cigarette. Wow. And it was easy. It wasn't hard. It was yeah. easy. I wore a patch for a while, but uh, it was easy. And that was the moment that I saw that something that I had, could not imagine had occurred to me. Because that thought would never have arisen in yeah. my mind prior to that. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. I'm really glad that you speak and, or, and do something for other people about the recovery uh, period because I, I feel like I'll, not too many people talk about it and yet it's, it's such an important phase in the... In it's the most important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's the absolutely. most important. Mm -hmm. And to give people the, the simple uh, method of, uh, get, you know, getting their minds right and yeah. uh, uh, taking control over their own life to the extent that they can. Taking control, they can, everybody can take control over their relationship with their own life. Mm -hmm. That's the truth, that anybody can. Yes. But not with, it, with a mind that is sickened by this terrible disease. This yeah. is a terrible autoimmune disease that has afflicted the human family forever. Yes. Yeah. That's wonderful. I'm glad you talked about it and I'm glad you talked about uh, the source of fear and uh, what to do about it uh, because recently uh, several uh, viewers have been asking about that and wanting to hear more about that so you pretty much cover it and also uh, your little booklet, a free download that people can get from your website is wonderful. I read it. I highly recommend it. It's uh, no more fear, no more anxiety. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. so, thank you so much, John. This has been a pleasure. Uh, <laughs> I love your stories. And uh, I love what you stand for. I love the simplicity of it. And um, it's, it's wonderful. And you have this project called uh, Just One Look. You're, is that still going on? Yes, that's the that. That is the term that we use for the actual work, okay. just one look. And it's, you know, it came to us because it's a catchy term and, and, uh, <laughs> and so forth, but it really is. It just takes that one look to finish it. Yes. There's a lot you can do after that that will make things even better, but that one look does away with the fear. Yes. It takes time for it to settle down, but that look is all it takes. And that has been uh, confirmed by more people than I can possibly count. Mm -hmm. It just it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just works. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone else, for watching. You've been watching uh, John uh, Sherman uh, from Ojai, California. And uh, I'm Nareed here in Budapest, Hungary. One, so, yes. One thing I'd like to, to tell your people, yes. and that is that we have an online open house webinar mm -hmm. on April 24th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Okay. And you can go to justonelook.org slash events and sign up for that. It's free and, uh, and it's... Every month. Every month. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Okay. Yeah, your website address will be posted on the credits. So please, everyone, you can take a look at that. And I believe you also offer private sessions if people need it. Yeah. And there's the forum as well. Everything is on the website, and it's, it's uh, very helpful, very helpful, and healing as well. Yeah. well. I'm glad to have had this time with you. Yeah, likewise. Anything else that I can, and no other questions. No? no? Pardon? No other questions. I think you covered everything, unless there's something I'm missing. <laughs> you covered everything. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I said, it's, um, 
the the simplicity of the teaching the the just one look and the simple feeling of of the breath and i can hear that over and over and i never get tired of it it's um i don't know why but because it, it maybe because it rings true for me it's uh there's um there's not much explanation needed right it's not right. <laughs> that's the that's the good part of it and we are now you know we we spent a long time not doing anything because it took so long time even after the we understood that we can, kind of had an understanding of it it took us a long time to be really confident of it it took the experience of the people in the forums and the experience we have with other people the you know to actually uh, consolidate the with clarity that this is real mm -hmm. and, uh, so now we are the reason we replied to you and we had a little interview another interview on monday and we are looking to speak to anybody who wants to speak to us and, yes. uh, and so i'd like to put that out there too absolutely absolutely and I highly recommend it because um, the simpler it is, the, the, the more authentic it is, in my opinion. My opinion, too. Yeah, there's, uh, there's all kinds of New Age stuff out there that is so confusing. Yeah. And we get that a lot, too, because my husband teaches, too, and people call and they've heard this and they heard that and they heard that. And there's so many um, co spiritual concepts that create obstacles for people where it's really quite simple uh, the the new kind of the new realm uh, the new wave of uh, uh western uh, western interpretation yes. of ancient spiritual teachings is uh i is causing a lot of a lot of pain i think and and to the teachers too i i yeah. see these folks and I can see that there's uh, a lot of uh, misery in there and I can relate to that because I've known that misery myself yeah uh, yeah yeah so. I think actually one of the first things that I heard I think three years ago even uh, I was watching one of your tapes or reading something that you wrote uh, was along the line of there are some teachers who have an awakening but and it's wonderful for them and they can talk about it but they don't know how to teach it yeah for some people it could have been a depression that woke them up or it could have been <clears throat> a, a terrible tragedy that shocked them out of their habitual thinking and woke them up but you can't impart that how yeah. are you you can't tell people okay be depressed for for so many years or go to jail or do or have a calamity in your life there still has to be a way to teach it and some people some teachers have learned how to teach it like yourself which is wonderful and some are probably still struggling with it okay yeah I'm very very grateful for my time with you here likewise me too it's been wonderful and feel free to stay in touch absolutely absolutely likewise okay Thank you very much again. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, please uh, go on to John's website and uh, feel free to attend his uh, once a month. What is it? Open house, you call it? Open house, yes. Open house, yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much and God bless. Okay. <laughs>